We hope you'll make it a monthly habit for those of you who are local and for my new friends from Minneapolis. Thank you so much for making this part of your agenda. So Lorenzo Center aims to preserve ethical values and practices in organizations and individuals. And we function as a sweet spot, as a nexus of faith and work, spirituality and daily life. And we ask the question, how do leaders integrate the values from their faith traditions into their business and leadership practices? So let's start with a word of prayer. Lord God, send your spirit, we pray, over us and over the whole world. Let your light dawn on earth among humankind. Reveal your power and may your kingdom come. May your will be done, O oh Lord. As we sit together here, waiting to be informed and inspired by our speakers and breaking bread with one another, bless the fellowship around the tables. O oh God, today is new unlike any other day. For God, you make each day different. Today, God's everyday grace falls on each soul like abundant seed, though we may hardly see it. Amen. So enjoy the lunch, good food and good conversation. And as you engage with one another, I have a homework assignment for you. You know, I am a professor after all. <laughs> and the question I hope you will engage with is, what contributes to flourishing communities. What contributes to flourishing communities? Enjoy the lunch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I won't ask you to present on it. <laughs> Today we are blessed to have three wonderful speakers who are leaders in our community. Paul Finster is president of the YMCA of Cassandre Counties. He graduated from MSUM in 1978, while I was in uh, first grade. <laughs> he started working in the farm while his family YMCA was going to college in 1975. I won't see how old I was. And was physical director when he left in 1970 to become director of program services in the Y in Bismarck. Following his time in Bismarck, Finster served as CEO of the Jamestown YMCA from 82 to 87 and, and CEO of Deloitte uh, from 87 to 92 before returning to the FM area in 1992. He lives in Palo with his wife Debbie. He has two daughters and four grandchildren. And Mark Knudsen, he graduated from MSUM. Thank you so much, MSUM, for giving us those speakers today. In 1992, with degrees in business administration and finance. His background includes finance, business management, business ownership, and mergers and acquisitions. In 2007, uh, Knudsen felt the call out of the corporate world to become the full-time race director for the Fargo Marathon and to start all Fargo events that he owns and manages, um, that owns and manages endurance events in the upper Midwest. Along with his wife Sue, he oversees nine road racing events, including, of course, the Fargo Marathon. I asked him today whether there was any Kenyan running the Fargo Marathon this year because, you know, we tend to win those races. <laughs> Never I can run. Um, they also own the Fargo Running Company as well as commercial rental property in West Fargo. Mark and Sue have six children between them and they're active in, he's active in, in church and maintains a strong faith. And finally, Sue Knudsen is director of GoFa event, a GoFa women run, and also owner of Web Service, a website development and management company. I guess I should be talking to her. I have a really bad website that needs help. Prior to 
Professor of Risk Management, she was a buyer at Moorhead State University, Moorhead Bookstore, and an executive for Target Corporation. And as I said, Mark and Sue have six children between them, and one of them is here with us today. So Paul, Mark, and Sue, welcome. very much for the opportunity to be here today and visit with you. I, I got to tell you up front, it's a little bit humbling to be up here because I was here last month and Kevin Kramer was the speaker and Kevin did just an outstanding job and of course uh, the history of, of the work that he's done is, is really tremendous and uh, his faith journey was, uh, was really great too to hear about that. And then I look back at the uh, the speakers in the past, and there's people like Marty Bailey and many others that have been up here, and I thought, gosh, what are they What are they asking a Moorhead State grad to come and talk at this Concordia deal for? But then I realized I've got Mark and Sue Knutson to back me up, so I felt a lot better. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, share a little bit about our organizations, and then also talk a little bit about our own personal faith journey. And then what we'd like to do is open it up for questions and dialogue with you uh, as we move forward. And uh, I think Faith kind of set the tone with uh, asking you a question that we'll probably ask you to uh, help respond to that as we uh, get towards the end of the program. Uh, but let me start with, uh, with my faith journey. I, I grew up in a small town in West Central Minnesota, uh, Starbucks. I don't know if anybody here has heard of Starbucks or been here before? Okay. It was a great place to grow up. Uh, you know, back at that time, uh, you kind of had free room in the community. You were out, uh, you know, my dad said he knew the season by the ball that I had in my hands. You know, in the spring and summer, you had a baseball and bat. In the fall, you had a football. In the winter, you had basketball. Uh, there was a lake, so we could go fishing and swimming and do those kinds of activities. Uh, we were just a short walk away from being able to go hunting or, or trapping gophers or all those kinds of things that just make for a great childhood. So really fortunate to, uh, to grow up there. Heavy Scandinavian, uh, I have to admit I'm 100% Norwegian. And so by the time I was seven years old, I was not only eating lutefisk, but I was liking it. And <laughs> So if you go to any of the Ludafisk events in November and December here, we'll probably see you there. But I was really fortunate because I had two great parents. And, uh, you know, when I grew up, my journey of faith, I think, really started when I was born. I was born into a Christian household and consider that to be a real blessing to this day. Uh, they, uh, there were two things you could be guaranteed on Sunday. One is you were going to go to church. And the second was that no matter what the situation had been the week before, my dad was going to put money in the offering plate. Uh, and we grew up, we didn't have a lot of money, uh, but my parents gave us something more important than that. They gave us unlimited time. They were always there for us. And it taught me uh, some real valuable lessons, I think, for, for life. Uh, one was that it's really important to give your time and your financial resources back when you can. Uh, I watched him every Sunday, and he might only have some change to put in the offering plate, but it didn't matter. Every Sunday, something went in that offering plate, and it made a tremendous difference in, in my life. I know that. So it was giving back not only uh, your financial resources, but also giving back your time and uh, being able to share that with, uh, with others in the community. I don't think there was an event that my sisters or myself participated in where they were not there. Uh, they were there to watch, or if they needed to, if, they needed, if there was a leader that was needed, whether it was scouts or age or some kind of athletic or, or music event, they were there to uh, to support it and, and be part of it. 
Uh, interestingly enough, they both had eighth grade education. Uh, you know, at that time, back at, it, it, that wasn't unusual. And my mom's mom died young. And so by the time she was 16, she was taking care of five siblings as kind of a mother figure to them. And then my dad uh, had to work on the farm. So neither one went past eighth grade, but I can tell you they were wise beyond their education. And they encouraged us uh, to, uh, to go beyond, uh, you know, the high school level and go to college. And so at a very young age, I decided that no matter what, I was gonna figure out a way to get to college and make it through college. I didn't quite know what that meant at that time, uh, but I found a way to do that. I started at UMM, uh, Minnesota Morris. I enjoyed that. Had a chance to stay at home and save some dollars the first couple of years. Uh, had a chance to play some college baseball, which was fun. And then, uh, maybe divine intervention, quite honestly, I uh, decided to transfer to Moorhead State. I had some friends up here, and they encouraged me to uh, come up to Moorhead. I uh, went to school, and that's where I got started in the Y. I needed a job, and a friend of mine had a job at the YMCA. And so I started as youth locker room supervisor at the YMCA 40 years ago this fall, actually. So uh, it's been quite a, quite a career, and I, I don't think I've missed many days at the Y since I first walked in the door. I loved it there. I loved the atmosphere. I loved what it was about. Back at that time, what I really liked was probably there were racquetball courts, there were basketball courts, there was a swimming pool, there was a running track, weights, all those things. And that was just right up my alley. So I might have spent more time at the Y than I did at the library at school. Uh, but that's beside the point. And at, that, uh, at the Y, I met a guy by the name of Dick Sisler. Uh, Dick was the president of the Y at that time. Some of you probably remember that name. Are there people out there that remember Dick? Yeah, wonderful person. Very Christian-based uh, person. Uh, a person that, you know, for the first time in my life, I had people that were, uh, were bosses, if you will, when I was growing up in different jobs that I held. But I never really worked for what I would call uh, today a leader, a, a person that had vision, uh, that cared about his people, that really uh, didn't look to find what was wrong in what a person was doing, but looked to find out what was right and try to encourage them to do the right things. One story that kind of, I think, epitomizes uh, why Dick made such a great, uh, uh, made such a big deal of, of my life or why, why it was so important to me. And when I was started out as a youth locker room supervisor, as I went along, I gradually was picking up more duties at the Y, a variety of things. And one day I got called into Dick's office and he said, you know, we need somebody to leave the youth basketball program at the Y. And I thought, wow, that's, I don't know if I can do that. I'm just a little farm boy from Starbucks, you know? How is this gonna work out? But I knew basketball, I knew kind of how that would work. So I said, you know, yeah, I think I, think I can do that. And then he said the, the, the magic word that just scared me to death. And that was, you know, you're gonna to have to do a little fundraising with this program. And I said, Dick, that, no, I, you know what? I don't even know what to say, but this isn't gonna work. I just can't do that. He goes, no, I have confidence in you. No one can do this. But for the next week, I just thought, dude, I went home and I told my, my wife, or my girlfriend at that time, now my wife, Deb, I said, you know, this is gonna be the most short-lived career in basketball as to why there ever was, because I'm, I'm gonna to have to raise some dollars. John, you'll appreciate this, uh, but he, he brought me in again, he said, you know, we're gonna to have to raise $1,000, and I want you to go out and do it. And he lined up uh, a person for me to call. His name was Don Pepcorn. Some of you might remember Don, too. His son, Dave, is on the Fargo Commission. Clara Pepcorn, I know, was a good supporter of Concordia. Always spoke highly of, of uh, Concordia College. Well, I, he said, call up Don and just visit with him. He's always liked basketball. He's always liked, uh, you know, the why. And he said, I think he got a chance to maybe do something there. So 
man, I called him up. I don't even know where I said the phone. I know my voice was shaking. I was scared. And he said, sure, I'd love to come in and visit with you. He came in. We sat down. We talked. And uh, he said, well, gosh, what, what do you need for this program? And I said, well, you know, it's going to be a thousand dollars, but you know, don't feel like you have to give it all. It don't, you know, if you can't give anything, don't feel like you have to do that. That's exactly I know how John approaches his fundraising. Thing, right, John? You know, it doesn't matter how much you give, and if you can't give anything, you know, don't worry about it. And my hands were sweaty, and I'm thinking, boy, this is, I don't know how this is going to go. But he pulls out his checkbook, and he wrote a thousand dollar check right there. So all of a sudden, I went from not being able to raise funds to thinking, boy, I am the god of funds. I can do it. This is going to work. I ran back to Dick's office, and of course, he was excited. He said, man, you did a great job. He said, how did you do it? What, you know, just complimented me up and down. And I walked like I was on cloud nine. Now, I told you earlier, I'm 100% Norwegian. So it took me a while to figure this out. But a year or two later, I'm sitting there in my office in Bismarck, and I'm thinking, you know, Dick Sisler lined that up before I even called Don Pepcorn. And it was simply to give me confidence and help me believe in myself so that the next time I go out, I would be ready to, to make a call and, and do it right. And I called him up, and. He just laughed and he said, I wouldn't do that to you, but I know for sure that's what he did. So, Tim taught me an awful lot, and one of the things he, he gave me that's really lasted a lifetime is the confidence to go out and raise funds, and there's probably a lot of people out there that wish he hadn't given me that confidence because uh, there's been a lot of dollars that we've been able to raise for, for the YMCA. And the other thing he did, I think he instilled the notion that you really have to build people up like that. Uh, you have to find ways to, to help them gain confidence. You have to, uh, when they do something right, uh, you make sure that you uh, you support them and uh, and give them give them high praise. So the rest is history in a sense. I started with the why and and faith kind of talked through some of the places that we've been, and I was uh, fortunate enough to come full circle back to the Fargo-Moorhead area back in 1992. Have been here ever since. Uh, we've had some uh, great times at the Y. Uh, we now serve uh, 60,000 people a year. About 20,000 of those are youth. Our budget's about $20 million. We have three recreational fitness facilities. We have a resident camp, Camp Cormont, that's been around. One of the oldest camps in the United States has been around since 1903. Uh, child care is big for us. We have over 30 child care sites and about 2,500 kids in child care. I believe we're the largest provider of child care in North and South Dakota for sure, and maybe even uh, a broader area than that. Um, and, I, and I think the bottom line, what I feel the best about is the, the, the support from the community allows us to make sure that we turn nobody away for inability to pay. And so anybody can afford to participate in our YMCA programs, activities, and membership. And, and we have about 15% of our population that uh, is under some sort of scholarship assistance. So with that, I just share uh, two Bible verses that have kind of been the, the foundation for me as, uh, as I think of my faith and how it relates to uh, working in the business community. And they both come from Proverbs. Uh, the first one is commit your work to the Lord and it will succeed. And the second one is we should make plans and make big plans and count on God to direct us. And you know what, what I found is when I, I'm in that mode and thinking that way and, and praying for, for the support that I need to do different things, you know, things usually go pretty good. Maybe not always the way I expected them to go. Uh, but we usually make positive progress. And when I try and wander off in my own direction sometimes, which I certainly have done many times, uh, things maybe don't go, go quite as well. So thank you for your time and attention, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Pursue. Thank you, Paul. 
um, hard to follow that up, but uh, I'm here to announce that I'm running for the governor of North Dakota. <laughs> no, okay, no. that's the icebreaker. No, I'm not running for governor, and I don't own anything uh, in downtown Fargo. So, um, my story is uh, is kind of a unique one. Uh, I think Paul kind of hit on uh, the the foundation of, of a strong family uh, as it pertains to both your person and your faith background. And uh, like Paul, I grew up in a small town uh, just north of here, uh, Hillsborough, North Dakota. Uh, very traditional ELCA uh, Lutheran family. We lived right next to the church, so we could never miss church. We had to be there. If you weren't there, people think you know there was something wrong and they'd come knock on your door. Uh, now we manage every service, and, and um, you know I do. I give credit to my parents too for for always just laying that groundwork, that foundation groundwork for uh, for faith that would take me through, you know, where I am today. Uh, and you think of the years through MSUM, uh, you know, going over to Trinity Church, you know, during college, um, that was a, that was a big thing for me too. It was it was uh, you're away from home and you know where do you go? Well, every Sunday you know you know you had you knew you had a home at the church. You know wherever you, wherever you were at, you could go to the church and. And, uh, and it was just, it just felt peaceful. Stressful times, you got finals going on, or you're you know, having problems with your girlfriend, but hey, you go to the church and just calm down for an hour and a half, and, and life was good. So so I, I do, I, I credit my, my parents too, and, and uh, the, the supporting cast that, uh, that was my family and is my family. So, um, you know, my, my, my personal background is, uh, as I mentioned, is kind of unique. Uh, I didn't graduate from MSUM and, and say, hey, I want to be a marathon director, because it just doesn't work that way. Uh, I actually graduated from there and, and went into the world of banking. My dad was a banker for almost 40 years, so I just assumed that's what I had to do, right? I was going to be a banker. Mr. Messerschmidt over there hired me. Uh, Green, uh, he hired me as an intern, actually. I wasn't even done with college yet. And uh, so I went into the world of banking and, you know, I quickly decided this is this is not for me. No, <laughs> no. Rock was a great a great boss and a great mentor. And you, know, you talk about people that that influence your life. Um, he was great, and, and I know Rock had a, a solid um, faith foundation too. And I knew that uh, as I worked for him, and, and so there was a, a nice common denominator there. But the world of finance was <clears throat> was interesting to me. I learned a lot uh, in the banking. Quickly got hired away about two years later to go work for. Uh, a pretty successful guy by the name of Gary Theraldson, and uh, worked for him for about 10 years, and uh, uh, we did a lot. <laughs> we did a lot of crazy stuff, and I, uh, the first time I went on a trip with him, I, uh, he had to come and sign for the car rental because I was only 24 years old, and I, they wouldn't let me even take a car, so. Uh, but he taught me a lot, and, and uh, you know, as successful as Gary's been, uh, a lot of people don't realize he had a solid core uh, faith foundation as well, and, and uh, I know he does to this day. We were just Paul and I were just talking about him, and, and uh, so that that was uh, that was great for me. Um, back to the world of banking, I actually ended up working at uh, Otter Tail Corporation. I see Chuck Hoagie over there. Chuck and I had a couple of trips uh, and learned a lot from him. Again, Chuck was a, a very solid um, person with a good faith. I know he's probably still on the board of his church. He was uh, at that time too. And um, again, the common denominator is these people are surrounding me. Everybody has um, you know, this faith background and, and it's a solid one. <laughs> so I'm working for Otter Tail Corporation and I decide that you know, this, isn't, this is just not working because I started this thing called the Fargo Marathon uh, as a volunteer piece. And you know, I was just doing it to to, uh, to raise some money for, uh, for charity, and uh, it just kind of started growing, uh, and it just kind of took over my life, and, and uh, I'd go to work, and you know, Chuck would be like, hey, can you get this done? I said, no, I got to do this marathon thing. <laughs> and it just, it literally was kind of like that. It, 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 it was taking up you know, 30, 40% of my time, and I just, I remember going in and saying, I, I, have, to, I have to make a decision. So, so we made a decision to, uh, to uh, leave the corporate world, uh, I don't wear these dress shirts very often, so uh, you won't see me in a tie unless it's for a funeral or a wedding. But uh, I left the corporate world at that 2007 and uh, started the race race management business, uh, go far events, and, and quickly had the you know the Fargo Marathon, of course. But uh, ventured off, started a race in Illinois in Champaign-Urbana called the Illinois Marathon.
Marathon, which today is six years old and hosts 20,000 plus people down there, and it's about a month before Fargo. So not many people realize that, but that was that was kind of a, 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 a exciting time, and, and we still have a good connection to, to the Illinois Marathon people. But I can remember going to Illinois. Uh, it was it was the uh, the first year of the race, and it was. Um, about a month before, and we were supposed to meet with the University of Illinois because we finished the race on the football field, Memorial Stadium. It's a big, big stadium, huge, 50,000 plus people. And we we're going to finish the race there, and I had to go meet with the athletic director. And he's pretty, you know, kind of a big guy, and, and uh, you wanted to impress him, you wanted to do a good job and make sure that, you know, he was happy with what you're doing. Well, we hadn't gotten our stuff done. We were so busy doing all this, these other things. We weren't ready. We weren't prepared to meet with them. And we were, we were having dinner the night before. We stopped to get something to eat at the um, con uh, drive through I think it was. And we are sitting there. We are so tired. We'd been up for you know 15 hours. And we just knew we weren't going to be able to get this, this presentation done for him. And I, I looked at it. Mike was with me. And I said, you know what? Let's just turn it over. We're going to pray on it tonight. We're going to go to bed. And we'll show up tomorrow. We'll just see how it goes. And, Sure enough, we walked in the athletic director's room and, and we didn't need a presentation. He just shook our hands and said, I like what you're doing. He goes, let's just do this. Let's make it happen. So, so that was kind of my, my, my big kind of faith moment there uh, with the Illinois Marathon. Myself running, um, I'm not, I, I wasn't made to run. I grew up hating running. Uh, Eddie Byer, who just passed away this week, was my basketball coach. Uh, he made us run so many killers in basketball. I, the idea of running uh, just, just you know, was the worst thing in the world to me. But um, uh, I got hooked on, on running uh, because a high school classmate of mine had done ground marathon. And so I thought, well, shoot, if he can do that, I can do that. So I started training for this marathon. I don't know a thing about it. I don't know anything about nutrition. I don't know anything about shoes, clothes, what I have to do. I just know you have to run. So I just start training. I'm running, 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 practicing running. And I'm getting hit by cars almost. And I just, you know, I'm running every morning. I'm out and run 10 miles. Oh, this is this is pretty good. I like it. It's losing some weight. My pants feel loose. I, it's kind of neat. Well, I get to Grandma's Marathon, the big day, first year ever. Had never even run a 5K, so my first race ever is a marathon. Man, <laughs> that even, just craziness, right? And and you guys can appreciate you can appreciate this. So so I'm running Grandma's Marathon. <clears throat> it's a beautiful, beautiful morning if you're a spectator because it starts off at 70 degrees. It's a great day to be a spectator, but a really 70 degrees is a really bad day to be a marathon runner. So I take off, and, and uh, as I trained, I hadn't really worked with the hydration thing. Because you, you know, you're running you know, out Highway 1, there's nowhere to stop and get water. So I'd go run you know, 15 miles and come back, or you know, 8 miles out and come back, and never drink water. So I well, gosh, I'm running this marathon. These, these aid stations here with water, and I don't really want to drink because if I do, I'm going to get a side ache, right? I'm going to, you know, back to the basketball days. Well, I just get a side ache if I'm running in basketball. So I skip the first aid station. I skip them all. I'm like, I don't need this water. I'm going to be fine. I take my first drink at about mile 15. And so if anybody knows anything about running, and I know, Kim, you get it. And, and uh, if, if you don't drink, it's 70 degrees and you run 15 miles, you're going to have some problems, OK? <laughs> so I get to mile 20. And this thing hits me like like a brick wall, a big wall. Because, you know, everybody's heard about hitting the wall when you're on marathon. I hit the wall so hard. I stopped and, and I didn't I looked around me, it was dizzy. I wasn't sure if I was gonna make it. I knew I was at mile twenty and, and I and I stopped and I'm looking around, I'm drinking water. By then they're giving you fruit and you're eating anything you you know, anything you can get in your system. And I looked up and this guy's passing me and he, I swear to God he was 90 years old and about 90 pounds and he's just like this running like this you know and i'm sitting here dying you know it's 26 year old kid and and he comes by and in the back of his shirt it says i'm built like a mac truck <laughs> uh, well that isn't just a kick in the pants I said that. so there's where the idea of perseverance kicked into my head and i said you know what I've got to do this because if that guy finishes and I don't, you know, I'll never let myself forgive myself. So, so I, uh, I picked it up and I started walking and trotted in and uh, humbly crossed the finish line of my first marathon. And I thought I was done. I said, bucket list checked off. I got into the, uh, the medical tent and after two liters of IV fluid, I was feeling pretty good again. Um, 
But I, I got up and <clears throat> I said, yeah, I don't think I'll ever do that again. And the next morning I looked in the paper and I saw my results. And by the time I drew back and had driven back to Fargo, I said, I think I could do that again. So, <laughs> so it's, you know, it's kind of an interesting deal how I, I kind of fell into the, the world of marathoning. Uh, I don't consider myself to be fast. Uh, I just, I, you know, I'm really all about um, the accomplishment of, of finishing the race. Uh, for many people that, you, you know, um, maybe a marathon isn't in their, isn't in their uh, um, sights, but for a lot of them, the 5K type of thing, 3.1 miles, that's a big deal. And I get just as excited when I see somebody finish their first 5K and get that medal and they come through, you know, and it's a, it's a big accomplishment for them. So, so I really take a lot of pride in that. I, I, I love to see what it does for people, um, you know, from a health standpoint, from a uh, confidence standpoint, I, I really do, um, I value that. So. So that's kind of it for me. Um, I'll turn over to my lovely wife, and uh, she'll uh, she'll finish this up in style. Thank you, Bart, my wonderful husband. Well, I'm not running for anything, so I'm not going to make any good announcements like that. You should have told me before you said that. Freak me out. Um, so my background is a lot like these guys. Um, I grew up in a very small town called Hickson, North Dakota. Anybody know Hickson? Yeah, out by Oxbow, yay. Um, and my parents were the same, uh, both very Scandinavian, Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish, and we grew up at the Hickson Lutheran Church, yeah, you betcha. We had luncheons after church, and we eat hot dish and jello. <laughs> Um, but I had great parents, and, and they were very, very faithful. And as I talk, you'll, you'll hear how faithful they were. Um, I have an older brother, and I had an older sister, and I have a younger sister, so there were, there were four of us. And my mom always said that we had the perfect family. Um, so I went to Kindred High School, and my older sister, Renee, was two years older than me. She was by far the most intense person I think I've ever met. She had to be first at everything. She was first in her class, she was valedictorian, she went to state and track, she was first chair of clarinet, she was just, you know, she had to win at everything. And being the younger sister that then, she had to beat me all the time. I was her practice. Hey Sue, let's go play basketball. Yeah, how that's gonna go. <laughs> So um, I tried, of course, following up with Renee, wanting to be in all the sports. You grow up in a small town, Kindred High School. You get to be in everything. There isn't a lot of kids to pick from, so you get to be in all of the sports. Well, I tried to be in track with Renee, um, and so we would go running together. And this is where my, my running story starts. I, like Mark, hated running. Hated running so bad that in sixth grade, I faked fainting to get out of running the 600 meter dash. <laughs> Literally, I laid on the ground. People were laughing, all my classmates were laughing at me. Ah, she fell. And I thought to myself, just lay still, lay still. They'll figure it out. <laughs> and they finally did. Oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? So in high school, I started running with Renee, and one particular day, uh, Renee and I went out running. Um, we wanted to do, you know, a long run at that time was like three miles. By half a mile in, I was dying. Oh, I hate this, Renee. I hate running. It started to snow. Oh, this sucks. It's so terrible. How can you make me run? And I finally went into the ditch and sat down and said, that's it. I'm not running anymore. And Renee got really mad at me. You get up and you start running. No, I'm not going to run. So she sprinted back to the school, got me in her green tree, you know, drove back to get me. And by the time she got back to get me, I was, you know, the whole Norwegian stubbornness coming through. I'm going to get up and I'm going to run. Yeah, I'm going to run. Yeah, go burn it. I'm going to run. So I started running again and she came driving by. So you get in the car. No, I'm not. I'm going to run. <laughs> So she turned around and she followed me all the way back to the school, yelling at me if I started to slow down, you keep running, 
12 30 you keep running i came to get you and you're gonna run so she forced me to run back to the school well fast forward to 2003 renee is married she has two children she made it through medical school graduated at the top of her class of course um, had received all sorts of accolades she was a OBGYN at Essentia in Avesta at the time and um, experienced some really weird, difficult medical issues. Um, she contracted some different kind of bacteria and infections. She went to Mayo Clinic. Over a series of three years, she had 12 surgeries. And in 2003, in July, she unexpectedly passed away. And she was 38 years old, and I'll never forget that night either. I was working at Target as an executive, and I get a phone call um, telling me that we needed to get to the hospital right away. And we get there, and my parents are there, and it's it's not good. And they tell us they've been trying to revive her, and they're trying to get her heart started, and it it just didn't work. And so that evening. Um, I went into the room, uh, kissed her on her forehead, said goodbye, and from there I could hear her voice telling me, you gotta keep running, you gotta keep running. So since then I've always wanted to do something in running his name, and something to keep her memory going, because she had given back to so many people, you know, as a doctor at Essentia, she was, uh, had delivered a ton of babies. She had seen a lot of women. She was, she was one of those weird people where she was super smart and very intellectual, but you, you wouldn't know she was a doctor because she's so down to earth. Um, she liked to give me a hard time all the time, beat on me. We always got into fights. But uh, she was just a wonderful person, and so I wanted to do something um, bad for her. And that's where the Go Far Woman race um, came into play, is I wanted to do something in her name, and she was a runner. And so what better way than to have a race that celebrates women's strength and celebrates what she stood for. Um, but I didn't know how to do that until I met Mark. Uh, Mark and I have been married five years in uh, December 18th. And after I met Mark, I told him about my story with Renee and how I wanted to do something for her, and he suggested that we, let's do a women's only race. And so with his guidance and help, we put together the Go Far Women race, and it's, it's blossomed. We're in, this will be our fourth year now this year having the race. And every year we get back to Essentia, to the NICU, where Renee delivered a lot of babies that ended up needing some additional help in the NICU. So, that voice um, from Renee, just, that's what drives my faith and drives me throughout the workday. When I'm having a bad day, when things aren't going right, I can hear her in my mind telling me, you keep running, you keep running, because that's, that's the final. When you, when you finally go home, you know, to God, then, then we know that we've completed that race. So, thank you. So the plan now is uh, to engage the three speakers by asking them questions. Could be about their organizations, their faith journey, their leadership. Anything. <coughs> Who wants to go first? Uh, John Pierce. One, uh, I went to the announcement for Doug Bourbon's uh, candidacy yesterday. I walked past the Y and uh, I saw Aurora's construction equipment out there and uh, the huge thing that you're that you're doing, and $20 million a year uh, for your budget, and all of the thousands, tens of thousands of people you 
sir. Um, question is for you, uh, Paul. Have you grown with it, or have there been moments of terror when you had to take it to the next level? Or? Well, uh, is the mic on? No. Test. Good question, John. Yeah, there's been many moments of fear, I think. I think if you're in a leadership position, there's times that you, you maybe try not to show it, but you go home at night and you wonder, God, what have I gotten myself into? So, uh, but, but I think those are the times, too, where maybe your faith ends up uh, being that solid foundation that you can rely on. And you realize that uh, somehow you're going to find a way through it. But yeah, many, many moments that you kind of wonder, gosh, how did I get myself here? And how is this going to work out? And you're not quite sure. When you look back, you look at the path and you say, man, how did that ever work out this way? Uh, but, but it did. And I think that's, uh, I think those are God moments that uh, somehow he carries you through. Uh, and thank you for mentioning my, the project. Uh, we are building a new pool. Our pool at the Y was 50 years old. Uh, was uh, way past its prime and uh, so we're excited May 1st we'll open a new pool. We'll have a six lane pool with uh, uh, a second pool that will be a family pool and a third pool that will be a warm water pool. So we're excited to uh, have the construction end and the uh, bringing in new members uh, get started. And as for Paul also, there has been, I believe, and I think it's still there, a sign on the east side of 40th Avenue about the new home for uh, a Moorhead YMCA. What are the plans? Yeah, uh, there, there is not a sign there anymore. Um, we, we did have great intentions to come to Moorhead, and there's still an interest in doing that. Uh, a couple of things happened. First of all, we, we hit, when we were out looking for dollars, uh, it was back in September of 2008 when the financial crisis hit and it made it very difficult to raise dollars. Uh, secondly, uh, at that same time, we had an opportunity with Maricare at that time and then turned to Sanford uh, to do a project out by the Shields Ice Hockey Arena, a facility that we now call Family Wellness. And we're still, to some degree, catching our breath on that. Uh, it's really taken off. We have 13,000 members there now. And it's a great facility for us. Uh, and so we're, we'll begin to look uh, forward again as to where we'll build a new facility and Moorhead certainly on the radar for that. Uh, but right at this point, there is no definitive time frame to, to do it. Uh, I wish I could give you something different, but at this point, nothing definitive. And if we did build, we probably would leave our options open. Uh, you know, down south, uh, southeast, where we had some land options. Uh, could still be a possibility, but we would look at any other options that would be available also. Hi, my question is for Paul also. Um, you mentioned earlier that your you know, services would impact the lives of literally thousands of young children. And I might be a little bit outdated, but I think the motto of the Y was something like body, mind, and spirit. And what I, my question for you is with all those young people coming in and you with a person of strong faith in God, what can you do from a wise standpoint to influence the lives of those young children and introducing them to God or, or, or spirit? And could you talk a little bit about some of the programming that you have there at the Y? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, well, first of all, you know, the Y when it first started back in London, England, was simply a Bible study for men and it was to keep them off the streets at night. So it, it started with a very direct Christian emphasis. Uh, and obviously it's changed significantly since that time. And we still have the mind, uh, body, spirit. Uh, we have the, the three core competencies that we think we have are social responsibility programming, healthy living, and youth development. And when you talk youth development, uh, we embrace five values, uh, caring, honesty, respect, responsibility, uh, and health. 
And those values we try and incorporate into the structure of our programs at the Y. Also at our camp, at our child care centers, uh, we have activities around faith that we, uh, we provide. We provide daily devotions and do things along those lines. We have one site at Calvary uh, Church in, on 45th Street uh, that is a Christian-based curriculum and is designed just for people that want that kind of curriculum. So um, I see Mike here, it, it's not to the same scale that Oak Grove is, but the, the curriculum is, is designed to have a Christian basis behind everything that we do. And then at our camp, Camp Cormorant, we try and do activities out there that are structured around the values that we, uh, we embrace, and also uh, there's some Christian basis behind what we, uh, what we do there. And, and then I think I would, I would uh, finish it off by saying we, hopefully we hire staff that have that uh, kind of commitment, and, and I think to the, you know, the leadership that they can provide and the mentorship they can provide hopefully makes a difference. Question for Mark. Of all the different marathon race models I've seen from around the country, I don't know that any have a Bible verse on them like yours has. And I'm just curious to what inspired you to do that and what kind of response you've had from that. Um, can you hear me again? Is that okay? Yeah. I can't tell. Um, yeah, the Bible verse on the back of that medal. Perseverance and race that is marked out for us. And uh, I've, I've been doing that, um, gosh, now for about eight years, seven, eight years. Uh, I put it on there at a time when, when uh, I was going through some personal struggles, and, uh, and it was very pertinent to me. And, and I put it on there um, knowing that I'd probably take a little bit of criticism for it. Um, but, you know, uh, I guess. <laughs> It, it was kind of one of those God moments, like Paul said, where you just say, you know what, if I might get criticized for doing that, well, then, then, then I don't need to be doing this anymore. So uh, the, the really neat thing about it is um, I probably had more positive feedback than I, I know I've had more positive feedback than I've had negative feedback. Uh, for every, every one critic, there are at least five people thanking me One thing I think is kind of neat is that we, we put the Bible verse on the kids' medals. We do a youth run, the 12 and under kids run. We put it on the, the kids' medals too, uh, which again, you know, you're kind of putting yourself out there because in today's world, um, that's not politically correct. Uh, but I, I love the feedback I get from parents who say thank you for putting that on the medal. And I, I don't know. I don't want to take you know too much praise for it, but I just, I just really, it means a lot to me, it's like the tagline of every one of my emails, I, it's incorporated in my emails, um, you know, I just, I don't know, I, I, I it, the, the verse itself is relevant to running, but in, in the grand scheme of things, that verse really doesn't really have anything to do with running, but it, 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 it kind of does with the marathon, but I don't know, I just, uh, I just feel good about it, and, uh, <coughs> As long as I'm doing the race, it'll, it'll be on the back there. I'd like to comment on that as well. <coughs> when I first got involved in the 5K, that was one of the things that really um, it just screamed to me. I thought, how oh, wonderful that you took the initiative to include that as part of the race. Because obviously, the race has started from you know personal desire. But um, sharing that and providing um, a platform for people of all abilities to uh, participate and um, something to look forward to with a sense of empowerment to and to get done with the race and be handed that medal and know that you know we don't do anything alone. Of course, we do it all by God's by will and with His help and um, just providing that that sense of community. It doesn't matter. I show up by myself. I've done it by myself. I've done it with a group of girls. And I always feel a sense of community, whether I'm alone or with friends. So thank you for that. I just want to 
wanted to say to, to Mark and Sue that I, I've hung out at the finish line of 63 marathons now. Not because I was running, but because I'm married to a runner. And um, yours is the best. The Fargo Marathon is absolutely the best. I've almost gotten killed in Boston. And, and that includes Maui, too. It's better than Maui. Absolutely positively warm and lovely and great. Well, except for the Fargo Marathon. I thought it was downtown Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it really is a wonderfully run marathon. I think Dick can confirm that as well. It's just, it's really, the crowds are fabulous. Um, and it's just, it's wonderfully done. And you've added so many things to it that have just enhanced not only the experience for the, for the runners, but for the whole community. So it's really, really, really cool. So congratulations, and we're glad you're here. Well, thank you. Uh, to both Mark and Sue, uh, as I look back, you've really demonstrated a spirit of entrepreneurship in uh, getting the Fargo Marathon launched to the place where it is today and Sue with your work in a similar vein. How do you carry that spirit of entrepreneurship to the next level? And what do you see as a vision for for moving ahead? Or will it just maintain? As it pertains to um, the world of running, uh, you know, it, it, it actually is a lot like a business. I mean, it is, we are a non Profit. Fargo Marathon is a nonprofit, and we have a very um, community charity based focus, um, but but not any dissimilar to say the world of banking, where a bank goes in on this corner and another bank goes in over here and another one over here. Uh, you know, we put on a race uh, ten years ago. There weren't a lot of races in this area. Um, now there are probably you know ten times as many races as there were. Every weekend, there's something happening, which is great for the sport, and which I think is great for the for the runners. Um, but it you know it challenges us to kind of try to, uh, you know, like Marty said, what can you do differently? You know, what how do you you have to look at it as what's the value add? Uh, you know, if I'm paying eighty dollars to come and run your marathon, why should I do yours and not this one over here in, in Duluth or Grand Forks or whatever? Um, so, so that that probably is, is a little bit challenging, but you know, we just kind of always felt that if we give if we give a great um, value to the runners, we, then, then we, um, they're going to tell other people to keep doing our events, uh, and you know, uh, then we'll just kind of grow exponentially like that. Uh, you know, I, I think the industry, I think it's always going to be. I, I think people in in the last twenty years as more families have become dual income families. Um, the days of being able to say, hey, I'm gonna go golfing for three hours today are kind of falling off a little bit. I mean, I think it's still good. No, no, Chuck, don't get mad at me. Um, you know, I, I think there, you know, there's still a lot of that out there, but, but you know, myself, I remember, hey, you know, the only time I'm gonna get to work out because I have little kids is five in the morning. So I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna go for my hour run at five in the morning. Uh, and then the rest of the day is, is work get home as family and that's you know life so so I, I see I see it always being very um, a very viable industry um, we are right now with a you know kind of an oversupply of races but you know get back to just the business model says give the customer what they want give them a good value and your 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 business will continue to sustain so, I don't know if I answered that kind of what you're looking for but Mark, this is Polly Thorsness, and I I like to run, but I'm not a marathoner. And my brother Lauren does 100 milers, and I can't understand how you can get your mind into doing that. And so I've always told him, when you allow me to ride my mule in a marathon, I will join him. Um, so I'm just wondering if you ever have thought about events where other people who could ride their horses or you know do other things with others of God's creatures to you know expand what you do maybe bring in a different whole different audience to what you're doing. Sure. Um, you know, I, as it pertains to the the marathon itself, um, you know, we've had people ask about doing uh, bike rides. We've had you know, can we have our dogs in there? Can we, uh, 
the race, the marathon itself, we kind of have to keep that um, to the runners and, and not, you know, get that too, uh, too, too uh, all-encompassing, I guess. But, but other events, uh, you know, if we were to do another type of uh, endurance event or something like that, I'm, not, I'm certainly not opposed to it. Uh, but as you look at it now, Mopar Events is right here, and um, Sue's daughter. So, you know, we put on about 10 races. Last year we did 10 races, and um, you just kind of get pretty spread thin. Uh, you know, if we had a bigger staff, if we, if we could afford to have more people, um, you know, I'd love to do it. We love, we love putting events on, and it's fun. And, um, you know, and, and the idea of, of something not related to running, uh, sure, we'd, we'd love to try it. Um, you know, if, if there was an audience for it, uh, you know, I think it would be, I think it'd be, it'd be very fun and you diversify yourself a little bit. I would like to just interject there. Mark is the kind of guy, you know, how everybody kind of stays within the box. He's consistently outside the box and thinking of all sorts of different events and ideas and what can we do next. And sometimes that does rain him down, but trust me, those kind of things have come up. So this is a question for everybody. Um, so, you know, both, both, everything you do has to do with, um, well, has at least something to do with athletics and, and um, fitness and so on. And it crosses, um, that crosses every, the whole spectrum of, of faith, um, Christian and otherwise. Just wondering how, in your professional efforts, you deal with the ecumenical aspects of the populace you're working with. In other words, um, how do you, for the non-Christians, is there any special, do you do anything at all to promote um, cooperation between different faiths? Just wondering how you deal with those issues. I can, I can try and start off and answer that, Dick. I think of the why we, we consider ourselves open to anybody and everybody, uh, regardless of their situation faith being one of those situations that you can consider. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> and then depending on maybe the school or the, the situation we're at, uh, we may have to adapt our programming to account for, uh, you know, it, it might be the faith or it might be the language they speak. And so I, I think we really try and adapt what we're doing to the, the people we're dealing with in, in specific programs. Uh, I'm trying to think of, um, something more specific than that other than just hopefully making sure and, and hoping that people see that we, we are open to anybody and everybody regardless of their faith even though we have that Christian base that we, we think is still solid. But I think the Christian base covers in a sense all faiths if you really look at it. I mean the Christian values are not just uh, for Christians, but they, they account across many religions. And so I think we, we have that base, but we're open to, to anybody and everybody, regardless of their faith background. You know, I, I guess as it pertains to what we do, uh, maybe specifically talking like the medal, you know, putting the Bible verse on the back of the medal, well, if somebody runs the race, Bible verse on the back of the medal is not saying you have to be a Christian or you have to, you know, this is just, this is just a great verse. So, you know, whether that, you know, pertains to your faith uh, or not, uh, it's, you know, we're not, we're not impressing that upon anybody saying you have to, you have to be a Christian to run the race. So, uh, same thing with the, you know, we do a devotional before the race. Personally, it isn't me saying, um, "Okay, now everybody bow your head." You, you know, I don't. If you don't want to pray, you don't pray. Um, so, his is probably a little more. You, you probably kind of put your thumb on a little bit more than I can. Ours is, you know, there's ten thousand people, so I don't really know, you know, who's who's praying or who who doesn't want the Bible verse on the back. The first year we did the Bible verse on the back of the medal, I actually made a hundred of them without the verse, and one person complained about it. So I mailed her a thing. Verse on the back. And then she sent me an email and said, I'm really sorry about that. Okay, you don't have to 
be sorry. I said, I just, I just expected I'd get a little flag for it. So I, you know, are you going to go for one? Did you go on the first one? And here you go. She kept the phone. <laughs> All right, so for a last question, how do you see what you do, and maybe this is obvious, but how do you see what you each do contributing to a flourishing community? No. <laughs> I get to start. They were supposed to answer this, weren't they? <laughs> um, well, I, I think, you know, at the Y, we really, we have a variety of programs. We have probably 100 different programs. So there's a lot of opportunity for a program in an area of your interest. But you know what I think we really do more of than anything else is we transform people's lives. Uh, we make a difference in the lives of the people we serve. It's obvious with the skill set that they might get if they're in aquatics or if they're in basketball or if they're in uh, gymnastics or something else. but. Uh, we really try and work with our staff to understand when they come in that it's not just a job, but we're here to transform people's lives and make a difference. Uh, you don't know when that person walks in off the street uh, what they've been going through that particular day or what their challenge is. You don't know what that youth that's coming to camp in the summer deals with every week other than the week they come to camp. And so what we try and ingrain in the minds of our staff people is that they're there obviously to teach swim lessons if that's the case or, or teach basketball if that's the situation but ultimately we, what we want to do is transform the lives of the people that we serve and, and we feel we've, we've had some success with that and, and we have the opportunity to do that with a lot of people when we talk about serving 60,000 people each year 20,000 youth, uh, kind of as Chuck alluded to, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to make a difference. And we hope that that's what we're doing to, to contribute to a flourishing community. Um, for, the, for the women's race, um, of course the Barbie Marathon is 20,000 plus people, the women's race is about 2,000. But any time you finish a race, whether it's a 5K, 10K, half marathon a relay it's, it's a, a feeling of accomplishment and the more we have the race the more I see and hear of stories of people that are, are just feeling that that sense of accomplishment that sense of achievement um, one story sticks out in my mind is this last year when, when Courtney was following the last runner that we had in the women's half marathon and she she was walking um, would jog slightly, but Courtney spent three hours with this gal finding out that she had just recently gone through a divorce. Her ex told her, you'll never be able to do that. Why even try? There's no way you'll accomplish that. But she did. She made it all the way back. And when she crossed that finish line, there was a ton of people we were all waiting for. And, and what a story for her to, I mean, tears coming down just because she felt that accomplishment. And that just resonates throughout the community, I think, where people see these events and they think, you know, that's something I can do. That's something that I can achieve as well. So I think uh, one of the things that I, I like about Fargo Marathon, about four years ago, we started a, a program called Shoes for Kids, where we actually take some of our proceeds that we get from the race and we work with a couple of partners here in town and we buy shoes and distribute them to the schools in the community, all the elementary schools. Over the last four years, we bought a thousand pairs of shoes every year. And we just bring them to the schools in August, September, and we say, okay, have at it. You, you know, principals, science teachers, you know who needs these better than we do. Um, and, and that, uh, for us, is, the, is a, such a tangible way Kids, having kids in sports, a lot of us have had kids in sports. Um, you know, it's not cheap. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, there's there's all those thousand pairs of shoes. They get used up right away. Um, so, you know, there's kids that can't go to school. There's kids going to school that need the basic thing like tennis shoes. Well, you know, pretty sure that they're not playing hockey. They can't afford it. They can't afford you know football. They, that stuff's probably outside of them. But we 
we, we think, well, if we give a pair of running shoes, um, the purest, simplest form of exercise is running. And, and a lot of those kids, they, they can go on and they can use that running to build their own confidence and to stay in shape and you know, keep themselves on the right track, hopefully, um, no pun intended. But um, so I, I think that's, that, that's something that we feel really good about is, is, is the shoes um, that we give to the kids. We hope to elevate that this year. And in addition to giving a 1,000 pairs of shoes, we hope to give a 1,000 registrations out to kids that want to come and do the youth run that, again, we can't afford a $10 registration fee, but if it's free, um, you know, build that confidence in. All right. I think that's a very good place to conclude. Thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> thank you all for coming today. It's a beautiful, wintry, fertile weather kind of day. We shall see you next month where the wise and wonderful Dr. Zavri will be sharing some stories of his leadership journey and what he's learned along the way. So hope to see you on February the 12th back at the Barry Auditorium on campus. Thank you so much. <laughs>